message is based on Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, and I gotta tell you, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. One of my faves. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Now, can you, can you guess why this might be one of my favorites? Do you have any clues as to why this might be one of my favorites? It's, it's one of the reasons why Jimmy Carter is one of my favorite presidents. Do you know why Jimmy Carter is one of my favorite presidents? Aside from the fact that he's a wonderful Christian man and teaches Sunday school. When he was president of the United States, he was teaching Sunday school. Let that one sink in. It's another reason why he's one of my favorites. The thing about it is you may not even agree with his politics. I'm not talking about politics right now. I'm talking Jimmy Carter, the man, the Christian man. I also um, am grateful for the work that he did through Habitat with Humanity. You know, Habitat for Humanity, you know, the building of homes to underserved people. Hey, listen, that nobody knew about Habitat and Humanity until Jimmy Carter put on an apron and picked up a hammer and started building homes, and now everybody knows that. Think about that. And then, of course, he started the Jimmy Carter Center, and uh, he's raised millions of dollars for what? To pay, to pay for a big, cushy library? No. That's not why he raised the money. Well, I'm sure he has a nice library in the presidential center. They all do. <coughs> but it came to his attention that there were over a million people who lived along the Nile River who it was common for many of them to have flies affect their eyes. That's not a pleasant thought, but that's exactly what happened. And it became known as the Nile River the Nile River blindness. There were over a million people who suffered from blindness. Jimmy Carter's organization, the, the Carter Center, invested millions of dollars and prevailed upon the pharmaceuticals to make a very, very inexpensive pill. It was that simple. And that money was invested, and there are now over a million people who have their sight. That's why I admire Jimmy Carter. Okay, there is one more thing. He's the shortest president of all of our, of our presidents. Jimmy Carter is not a tall man. Actually, when he went to speak, he carried a run box around. <laughs> he would get behind a podium and put a box down here so it would make him look a little taller. Five six on a really good really day. Five foot six. He's not a tall man. And you know, I'm thinking to myself, if Jimmy Carter can make it, so can I. You know? So I, I would say my second favorite, uh, my first favorite, uh, Short person would have to be Zacchaeus. I mean, I, I love the story of Zacchaeus. Um, so, do you guys remember the little children's song that we learned in Sunday school? Now, I'm not exactly sure what it goes by, but if you know it, sing it aloud with me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. To one to see, and as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. Thank you so much. You got that one down. Does everybody else remember that or no? Was that new for you? Okay. Well, it's an unusual song. I love it. And uh, what I want to try to say to you is, uh, I wish it's, I wish it was in the man. I wish it was in the hymn book because that song is very rich. It really tells a powerful, powerful story.
So let's look at the passage together. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. In the moments we have left together this morning, this afternoon. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. So, would it be fair to say he was one of the most popular men in Jericho? Probably not. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that day. So, we can say this about Zacchaeus. He wasn't very popular. He was a short man, but he was ingenious. He was not going to give up uh, in his quest to, lie, to lay eyes on Jesus. And who knows? Maybe even Jesus lay eyes on him. All the people saw this, and they began to mutter. You ever heard muttering? Mutter, 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 mutter. They began to mutter. He has gone to the guest of a sinner. Oh boy, I bet there were a group of people who were really ticked off with Jesus. Uh, let's see, the Pharisees. Do you think they were happy with Jesus going in the, in the home of a notorious sinner and a traitor to his people? Because that's how he was viewed. So you think that made the Pharisees happy? Who took great pride in determining, I will hang out with you, but I definitely don't want to even get near you. Well, Zacchaeus is one of those guys that nobody wanted to get near. They were just trying to be good Jews and not be contaminated by the sin of this world. You know any Christians like that? Yeah, me too. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. What an amazing response. Jesus said, I want to go eat at your house. And that's all Jesus said to him, right? And in that moment, it's just a beautiful snapshot of how the Holy Spirit works in a person's life. He was immediately convicted by his greed, by his lying, by his theft. He was immediately convicted by that and said, Jesus, man, I, 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 I'm going to try to make that right. And I, I'm sure that made Jesus, I'm sure it made Jesus very, very happy. Um, you know, there is something to be said for repentance. Um, repentance is not just godly sorrow for your sin. Repentance is not just saying, well, you know, Jesus, I'm sorry, man. I really messed up. I cheated these people, and, and I'm really sorry. Can you forgive me, Jesus? Well, I'm sure Jesus forgave me. But that's not the point. He took the next step. He repented of his sin. The word repent in the Greek is metanoia which means to do an about face. It's a military term. About, hey! Anybody here heard that command before? Okay. And it's literally, you learn how to turn around and do a 180. You actually, you're looking this way, and then you make that maneuver, and you're facing an, an entirely new direction. Now, you guys remember go over by Remember watching Gober Pyle? He wasn't very good at marching. And he wasn't very good at about faces. And it was kind of ugly, wasn't it? I felt kind of sorry for him. But there is something beautiful when a whole congregation, keeping in step with the Spirit, repents. It doesn't about face. What a beautiful, beautiful sight. And so, when Jesus looked upon Zacchaeus' repentance, it was beautiful. But then, something happened next that we don't hear much about these days. We don't hear much preaching about it. It's called restitution. 
Because that's exactly what he did. Not only was there repentance, but there was restitution. He said, I want to get, make sure I get the exact word right, but those that I've stolen from, I'm going to start giving them money back. Lord, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. That is some serious restitution. I'm not sure that anywhere in the scripture, when we're asked to do restitution, that it has to be four times the amount. Leviticus. In Leviticus, that was the law. I figured that was it. But in today's circles, and even in Christian circles, I'm not sure we can demand a times four restitution. But I think we can still use restitution language. Um, I'm going to tell you a story that I did not tell to the Makanji people. When I was a, a mere lad of like 12 or 13 years of age, I went into a drugstore owned by a Jewish guy in Lexington Park, Maryland, and I stole some stuff from him. Me and my cousins. We were up to no good, had way too much free time on our hands. And so we walked into that uh, drugstore and we stole some stuff. Well, my mother, being the sneaky little woman she is, found it. Where did this come from? Yeah, I, I got it over at the drugstore. Well, how did you pay for it? You don't have any money. <laughs> um, of course, then I knew my mom had called me. And I said, well, Mama, I did steal it. Well, I'm gonna go tell your dad. I said, all right. So I was preparing myself for him to go for his belly. That was his default way of, of disciplining men. May he would take off his belt and tune me up. I learned a really good avoid the belt dance, though. I could really, I could move away from the belt. But he always found me with his belt. My dad came to me, he didn't say one thing about his belt. He said, you made all that stuff that you just stole, and we're getting in a car, we're going back. We're going back to the drugstore. Oh man, this is worse than getting a belt. Can I, can't you just beat me? <laughs> do I have to do this? Yes, yes you do. So sure enough, man, I walked into the drugstore with this handful of things I'd stolen. He walked up, he said, Mr. Gelrod, this is my son, Buddy. He's got something he wants to say to you. Yeah, I, 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 I sold some stuff from your drugstore. I'm really, really sorry. Here it is. And he said, okay, that's fine. So I will be calling the police. So my dad went to my defense. He go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Mr. Gilbert, he did the right thing, he brought it back. I don't care, he broke the law. I'm sick and tired of kids stealing stuff out of my store. I'm calling the police. Mr. Gilbert, would it be okay instead of that if I just paid for all of this? Well, I, I suppose so. So I guarantee you it won't happen again. So my dad chucked out a couple of dollars and paid him off and we went out. What made it real, really hard is my dad never said a word about it. Years later, I asked him something about it. He said, there was nothing for me to say. You were, ta you were taught a lesson. There's nothing for me to say. You'll never do it again, will you? I said, absolutely not. He said, okay. But I learned that day about restitution. Oh, and by the way, he held my allowance until the, uh, I used to get 50 cents from mowing the grass. Gave me some spending money. But he held that until um, it, it was completely paid back. So I want to tell you that the second experience I have is, 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 is pretty difficult to talk about. One of my very, very best friends in the world got himself in a jam um, and stole some money from me. And all these years later, 45 years later, he was caught because he stole from me and two or three other guys that we were very close with. He was caught. To my knowledge, he never apologized to any of us. And all those years later, 
He's never made restitution for the money that he stole from me. And I gotta tell you, I forgive him. But that really bothers me. Because he's really not come to terms with what he did. I think a part of being forgiven of our sins is to come to terms with what we've done. Not pretend like it never happened. But if we can, if it's within our power to do so, we ought to try to make it right. <laughs> so I think that's true. That's definitely true for me. I've had those two experiences that involve restitution. And I just want to say to you, you're never really going to be totally free from that sin until you've at least attempted to make it right. Maybe the sin was gossip. Maybe you need to make it right. Maybe the sin was an attitude that wasn't right. Maybe it was you did actually take some, something of substance that did not belong to you. I know that God forgives you. And knowing you, you probably asked the Lord to forgive you. That's wonderful. Make it right. Because in my mind, that is a powerful, powerful witness to God's grace. Okay, one more story about my mom. Okay? And then we're going to have communion together. Um, this, I know it's going to be hard for you to believe, but there was, time, there was a time when I was short and, and kind of uh, stocky. Okay, I was chubby. <laughs> I, you know, I was in 12th grade, I was like 5'3 and weighed 200 pounds. Jeez. The only place my mom could shop for clothes for me was in a place in Washington, D.C. that just had one big sign on the top of it. Would you like to know what the big sign was? Okay. <laughs> no, it was like. Um, I totally went on what the store had on it. <laughs> big, that was before the days of big and tall. I can't remember. I'll remember it. Husky. 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 Big store. Husky. People probably thought it was a, a place to take your dog. I don't know. But my mom knew what it was. It was a place for chubby guys like me or husky guys like me to buy clothes. So we went in to buy clothes for my seventh grade year to go to school. And uh, she bought bags and bags of husky clothes for me to go to school. And we got home, and as my mother would often do, she would always lay everything out on the bed. And then she would check it against her receipt. Have you ever seen that? Well, she would check it against her receipt, and sure enough, there was a belt in there that cost one dollar and was in the bag. But she looked at her receipt, and she had not paid for it. But get in the car. We're going back to Washington. Mom, that's an hour from here. We live an hour from Washington, D.C. No, I'll never forget it. Here's what she said. We're holiness people. We have an opportunity here to share our witness, and that's what we're going to do. I remember that trip. I remember the whole time thinking to myself, my mother is crazy. This is a dollar. This is one dollar. A dollar. And we're going to travel to Washington, D.C. Mama, are you sure? Yes, buddy. Just buckle up and be quiet. We're going back to Washington. So we went back and walked in. And I was standing right there. And I watched this whole thing. Hi, my name is Katie Reedy, and this is my son, Buddy, and we were just in a few moments ago. Oh, I remember you. Yes, indeed, Mrs. Reedy. How can we help you? Is everything okay? No, everything is not okay. And you can see the woman behind the counter just tightened right up. No, no, no. She said, that's fine. She said, I just want you to know that when we got home, we realized that we had this belt in the bag, and we hadn't paid for it. And so here's the dollar. And this woman said, I, I've been working in retail for a long, long time, but I've never seen anything like this. Didn't you say you lived in St. Mary's County? Yes. Why would you do that? <laughs> you see, 
to my mom, if you ask her a question like that, that's like throwing a dog or bone to a dog. <laughs> she goes, well, just let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. And, and she just shared her testimony there, and that woman was weeping. Now, I don't know if that woman ever, ever made a decision to follow Christ or not, but I'll tell you what, she will never forget that testimony. Ever. And I think that is the power of restitution and making things right. Even though she had not done anything intentionally, my mom, so when I hear something like full salvation, Craig, when I hear something like full salvation, how do you say, well, I'm not even sure that's possible. Yes, it is. I've seen it. I've seen it. What can happen in the life of a person when they are fully committed to the cause of Christ? Fully committed and, check it out, full of the Holy Spirit. That's what it looks like. The good news about the story of Zacchaeus, and with this our time is up. I'm going to have communion, but see, the this story about Zacchaeus just absolutely drips with grace. Grace. It's all about grace. It's all about the grace that would stop the Messiah in, in his tracks in the middle of the road and notice someone who, quite frankly, didn't deserve to be noticed. That's my Jesus. Believe me. I did not deserve to be noticed by Jesus. Not only did he notice me, he pursued me. He pursued me. And if Zacchaeus had refused, it's not a good idea to preach about what's not in the scriptures, but if Zacchaeus had refused to come down, I want to tell you something about Jesus. I believe that Jesus would have been up that tree. I believe that Jesus would have gone to impossible lengths to reach Zacchaeus. I, I just believe that's the kind of Jesus we have. He pursues us and then he offers us what we do not deserve. Yeah. That, that to me is why the story of Zacchaeus is so powerful. It's so simple. It's as simple as a little song, but it is so powerful. I am so glad. You say, well, Pastor Bud, where do I fit in this story? That's simple. He's in pursuit of you. He is in pursuit of you. No matter where you are, no matter what you're up to, no matter what you've done, no what kind of tree you find yourself in, Jesus stopping and pursuing them. And I gotta tell you, I am hopelessly in love with this Jesus. Hopelessly in love. Brother Craig, would you help me distribute the elements? <laughs> and on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was in a room that had been rented for him and his disciples to share a meal together. And that they did. It was during the Passover season. And I'm sure they enjoyed a Passover. I'll take that. Take one. Thank you. They enjoyed a Passover meal together. And when they were, after they had finished the Passover meal and they were lounging at the table, by the way, it would be hard not to lounge because there were no chairs. You would sit down on the floor. So they were lounging around. And so Jesus as my mother would say, Jesus shocked the daylights out of him. The daylights of him. I don't know exactly what mom meant by that, but he said something that was so radical. It, 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 it's taken the church hundreds of years to really figure out what he said. Okay? And it's still a bit of a mystery to me, but he holds a piece of, of bread like this. I want you to touch it. It's real. 
as real as Jesus. He took the piece of bread, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat this now, and remember that Christ pursued you and died for you. And then he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he passed it among his disciples. Now he really had their attention. Okay, this bread, my body thing, that's a surprise. What's he going to say next? He said, you see this cup here? This is my blood, which is poured out for you. It's a new covenant that I'm making with you. You know the old covenant that was based on your performance, based on your deeds? This covenant is based upon my free gift of grace. What you're holding in your hands right now is a gift. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It is a gift. And Jesus said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Take and drink this. And remember that Christ died for you and may it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. You may take the cup. That involuntary sound I just made. Don't you know this satisfies like nothing else? You know, on a really hot day after you've been out cutting your grass, and then you've got a nice big cold glass of water, and you take that water and drink it, you go, ah. This satisfies. Speaking of satisfies, I love this hymn. All my life long I have panted for a draught from some cool spring that I thought would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah, I have found him, whom my soul so long had craved. Jesus, what? Satisfies, Satisfies my longings. Through his blood I now am saved. Okay, let's sing, man. We've got like a gazillion.